Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip, the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit MagnaGrip.com. The Fire Store, equipping protectors with passion. Every decision the Fire Store makes as a company is about its customers. As the holiday season has quickly approached, explore a wide selection of unique and practical gifts at the Fire Store's gift center. Find the perfect presents for firefighters, EMTs, and first responders today. The Fire Store's goal is to get you the gear you need, when you need it, at prices you can afford. Visit thefirestore.com for everything but the truck and shop its family of brands including Streamlight, MSA, Lion, Fleer, and more. Hello, everybody. This is Eric Dryman uh, with the Hooks and Hoses podcast coming to you for the December issue of the podcast. Uh, I've got a friend of mine, uh, Lieutenant Chris Short, uh, who's going to be my guest tonight. He's a, a firefighter with the Baltimore City Fire Department. He's been a firefighter for over 20 years now. Got his start in uh, Pennsylvania and then uh, transitioned to the career side um, about 13 years ago with uh, Baltimore City Fire Department. Spent the majority of his time in truck companies, and I'm sure we'll get into those conversations as we uh, move through the podcast. But uh, Chris was uh, on Truck 8 for quite a few years and then moved to Truck 5 about a year ago. Truck 5 is the busiest truck company in Baltimore. And then uh, just recently, uh, this year I believe, got promoted to a lieutenant. So he's now a lieutenant, uh, frontline supervisor, and he uh, is now a lieutenant on engine 31 in Baltimore City. So Chris, it's nice to have you on the podcast. I appreciate you taking some time to spend with me uh, and uh, hang out for an hour or so. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate you you inviting me on here. It's an honor. You know, we I go back a little it. ways and it's not an honor to get together and do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Chris and I, Chris and I first met in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. We'll call it Little Rock. It was outside of Little Rock, but uh, you know, four or five years ago. And uh, the man drinks more Monster Energy drinks in a day than I think most people do in a year. But uh, um, but he's high speed, low drag kind of guy. Um, I was I was taken back by his intensity from you know when I first met him. Uh, definitely knows his job and. Uh, you know, has a lot of experience um, going to fires and uh, making runs and doing all the things that, that firefighters want to do. So I'm really looking forward to getting into this conversation. Uh, one of the first things I want to talk to Chris about is um, back in 2019, Chris, you uh, had the unfortunate uh, experience of of uh, getting hurt at an incident. Uh, so if you could just take the audience through that, what, you know, what you were dispatched to, what you saw when you got there, you know, the things you did, what ended up uh, happening to you. And, and, and then we'll go on, we'll go on with the, uh, the rest of the conversation. So. Absolutely. Yeah. It was, uh, it was a November night. Uh, actually, actually it was a really nice night. We uh, did a lot of stuff during the day, you know, we're 24s and uh, we were uh, painting some hooks, getting some just general tool care uh truck eight and had a bunch of ladders off we actually went mutual aid into baltimore county for a dwelling fire that morning and uh i guess i should have saw this coming when when i broke my favorite axe on a roof <laughs> that should have been a tall tale sign <laughs> but uh now all joking aside it, it um you know got later in the evening and we started eating dinner hanging out uh you know everybody's favorite spot is the firehouse kitchen table and uh we're laughing it up, you know, joking. Box alarm comes in for uh, 30 box, which is the box area for truck eight. And uh, got dispatched as a, uh, I think it was a, I think it just came in as a building fire. And uh, I was talking to my lieutenant on the way there. My lieutenant and I were, we, we were, we were really tight when we worked together. And uh, he asked me to come over to his, his, um, his shift and be his 
one of his EVDs, which is emergency vehicle driver. So I drive and tiller ladder trucks. And uh, that night I was driving and uh, coming down the hill just before the turn to get onto the, the street to where the garage was, and the, ended up being a garage where the garage was. And I remember saying to him, I was like, man, if, if this is, if this is this garage that I'm thinking of this, this is going to be a mess. I just, I don't like this. He kind of looked at me and we're like, all right, well, you know what? We got it. We ain't worried about it. We'll, we'll figure it out. And uh, as soon as we came to the intersection, I get ready to turn. I just look over and it was just black. Like it was, I mean, of course it's dark. It's 1900 hours. So it's dark in November, but <clears throat> you could, you could still see that distinct black smoke coming out. And, uh, made the turn. I was like, all right, man, well, here we go, LT, let's do it. And made the turn. And as soon as we made the turn, the, uh, there was no fire showing. It was all, it was all smoke. And it was a, bear with me. I want to say I, three, four bay garage. Uh, it used to be a chop shop. And then with offices on the Alpha Delta corner. So we go to pull in and <laughs> there's, there's, I got to put a little laughter in here to keep my mind off, you know, on topic and off things with uh, the heartbreak it, it brings in, you know, the mental side of things. And uh, I remember making a turn and my lieutenant, he has all the faith in the world in me, but he turned and looked at me. He's like, bro, there ain't no way we're making that turn. I said, just, just, you stay there, lieutenant. You press, you press buttons. I'll drive the truck. And uh, <laughs> it was a, it was a gated fence up and there was a post right there. I think it was on the officer's side. And man, I hugged that. I hugged those things like, like our life depended on it. And I just, I maneuvered that truck and it just got it right in a perfect position. I mean, we were perpendicular with the, uh, with the building and the driveway. Like it was, it was a perfect spot. And uh, of course we're in a reserve truck. So it's, it's very hit and miss when things actually want to work the right way, you know, especially when they're getting beat up throughout the year, like, like Baltimore city does. And uh, my job as a driver is to go to the roof and open the roof up. And there was no fire showing at this time. So I, you know, I yelled to my crew. I said, Hey guys, I'm gonna go up. I'm, you know, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try to get on the roof. So I go up, go to throw the stick. It's not working. Okay, well, there's tall tale sign number two that something's just not going to go right. So uh, I yelled down to my partner who was tillering that night, and I, he was a longtime friend of mine. Um, I turned to him, I said, hey, man, redo those outriggers for me. Let's see if we can't get this thing. Maybe it's unbalanced. Maybe it's just kind of, you know, them, them older trucks, especially uh, them outriggers, they'll, they'll settle themselves sometimes. So I always get in the practice of lift them all the way up. And, uh, that night I did, I think it was just, you know, maybe just a stroke of luck. It just didn't want to, it just wasn't in the mood that night. I don't know. So I jumped down because that didn't work. I jumped down. I re, I, you know, just like we teach our rookies, just like we teach our new drivers and new officers, just start back at square one. So I did, you know, jump in PTO, everything got up, started to get now ladder went up. So I go to the ladder. I start, start rotating over to the roof. And no sooner did I do that, that the, uh, and it was only one story garage, so it was probably, I'd say, probably a hundred by maybe fifteen deep. It, it really, it wasn't all that big per se. It might even be exaggerated a hundred. It might not even been that. Uh, but it's only about twelve foot high to the highest part of the building, so it, it wasn't a crazy, crazy building. And uh, as as I'm rotating the ladder over, the uh, Delta Alpha side caved in on the roof and fire just jacked right out of it all right well no problem saves me job i gotta do you know so i come down yelled to the crew i said all right guys you know my lieutenant was like trying to get command like he had command the first arriving officer and uh he's kind of just going through trying to figure out where everything's at what's going on you know a mile a minute first first in line officer your, your mind's going a mile a minute so we always had a thing where we make the best judgment call we can with each other so I yelled over to him. I said, hey, change of plans. I'm going to go over and get these overhead doors. And I yelled over to my partner. I said, you guys start working on that side. I'll go over here. You know, we'll work together, meet in the middle. So we did. And I grabbed the saw, ran all the way over to the Bravo Alpha corner. Alpha Bravo corner, rather. Let me put it that way. And uh, it's probably, <laughs> of course, luck we have. It has, to be, it has to be the biggest door. So I go over to the door and start the saw. And the one thing that I can't stand that I that I always veered away from when I was teaching was the, the V cut in a garage door. 
you, you want that thing opened up, so open it up. You know, you want to get in there. The biggest part is wanting a degress, you know, and having control. The, the, you're not even worried about control of the door. You just want that, that egress part of it. So I ran up, started getting ready for my barn door cut. I cut it was high as it was it was high as heck. So I started cutting over, and uh, it started to buckle a little bit. And I said, you know, something just ain't right. I said, but it I might have just taken some tension off it. Maybe I hit a you know maybe I hit one of the wires, and it just that that tension broke loose, you know, and it just buckled a little bit. So I start cutting. I, I, I cut over. I make my cross cut. I start cutting down. And uh, this time, my lieutenant Vaughn came running over. He's like, "Chris, I don't like this. Finish that cut and get the hell out of here." No sooner did he say it, I literally stopped him. I was like, "Lou, I'm one step ahead of you. Like, I got one foot in the direction I'm cutting, and the other foot in the other direction to run away." I said, "I don't like this, but we got a job to do. Even if you feel uncomfortable, your exterior, you still got a job to do. You know." So I'm a firm believer in you, you do what it takes to get the job done as long as you can. You know, if, if you could do it, do it. So I started cutting down. I'm like, you know what? This I, I don't like it. I'm done. I'm, I'm done. So I dropped my saw and I turn around. And uh, <clears throat> no sooner did I turn around and go to walk. I, I actually went to run away. And no sooner did I turn around. I, I swear on everything, it, it was like a movie. You, you, I, I couldn't make this up if I wanted to. And I, believe me, I wish I could. Uh, everything got dead silent. As if, uh, like, you're watching a war movie, you're watching a movie, uh, you know, a dramatic movie, and all of a sudden everything goes silent before a loud explosion or, or you know, before something actually pops off. And it, I just remember it getting really, really, really silent. And I remember telling myself, all right, dude, we, <laughs> we got to get the hell out of here. So I go to run, and as soon as I went to run, I just felt, I heard this loud boom and just felt this, like, immense, I don't even know what to call it, like a, like a, just a, a hard hit to my body that just lifted me up off the ground and threw me. And I remember being in the air, and I just felt every bone and every nerve and every piece of skin on my body was just hurting like it was just nothing but pain couldn't move I couldn't do anything and I remember hitting the ground and going unconscious obviously I don't remember going unconscious but I remember you know being awake and then all of a sudden waking up going what the hell just happened so uh as that happened I went to move and I just I couldn't move um and then I got up I, I went to stand and I remember because I mean I've been I, I've been teaching writ and May Day and, and stuff for probably 16 years now. So it's, it's drilled into my head. And I, I very calmly was like, all right, I got to call the May Day. I got to call May Day. I don't know what's going on right now. I don't know where I am. I, I What the hell? And I'm like trying to trying to get my mind right. And all I'm seeing is like, um, I don't know if you guys remember this, but when you're in high school, especially like towards prom season, they bring in those uh, DUI sunglasses or those glasses. And you got to kind of, Try to walk a straight line, but it's like you're drunk. And that's exactly what it was like. Like everything was blurry. Everything, it looked like stuff was there and it wasn't. I just, I couldn't get my mind right. And I remember yelling Mayday. And I, I like literally was trying to get my arm up because I always kept my radio right here, my, my lapel mic. And I remember trying to grab my radio and I just, I couldn't, I just could not lift my body. My body just would not function. And like, I'm trying to like throw my arm up. And I remember just going May, and then I got hit with something else, and I just collapsed. I, I collapsed. I bounced off a car that was there, and I know that because of you know the after action report that my lieutenant and I have done a hundred times. Um, it made sense to why the the one part of my head was hurting and why the rest of my body was hurting, why my other part of my head was hurting. And I guess from what they said, um, they looked over at me and I was trying to get up. I don't remember it at all. I was trying to get up and they said, Lily looked like a cartoon character when that like TNT iron anvil comes down and like traps them in. And they're like, you know, like a worm trying to get themselves out. And it, they said, that's it. That's what I was doing. I was fighting with everything I had. And uh, I was so pinned and, and so much pain. I, I couldn't do anything. So, they, uh, my, my lieutenant and another lieutenant from another engine company that was there, they came over, grabbed me, dragged me up the hill, and uh, 
the whole time I was yelling because we didn't get issued rubber boots at the time. We only got issued uh, the rubber ones. I remember yelling, you know, don't cut my boots. Don't cut my boots. These are, these are expensive boots. Don't cut my leather boots, man. And uh, they're like taking everything off me and stuff. So it's, you know, and uh, the next thing I know, I'm, I'm in the back of the, the medic and just everybody surrounding me, sticking me left and right, heart monitor, drugs, all kind. Of, I'm just like, wow. You know, and like seeing some of the people that I brought up in the fire service that are career with me and seeing some of them that I, that I used to write when I rode the medic, you know, <laughs> probably 11 years ago that I rode the medic with just working on me and seeing the pain in their face and everything started to kind of come around of what happened. And next thing I know, I'm in, I'm in the, I'm not the ICU, uh, shock trauma. And I'm just sitting there like trying to figure out what the hell just happened. And everybody, you know, you got everybody coming in and it's just all hitting you at once. And it's just like nothing's settling. Nothing's, nothing's kicking in. Nothing's like giving you a recollection of anything. And you're just kind of sitting there like, uh, almost like, well, it's, it's Christmas time. So it's almost like being the Scrooge with the, with the ghost of Christmas past. And you're just seeing yourself like just sitting there confused. Like, I, what do I do? I don't know what I could do right now. Like, I want to help you. I, it, it, that's what it felt, it felt like a third person, you know, and it took, it took quite a while for everything to kind of roll around to come back to what actually happened. So, and I, I it was, yeah, it was, it was interesting. <laughs> yeah. So let's, uh, before we continue on with your story, let's, let's talk about the fire itself. Um, so you were, you were cutting this overhead door. Um, do you know, did you in the after action was it determined was it a smoke explosion was it a backdraft did a compressed so, cylinder let go i mean what do you know what uno- caused unofficially yeah unofficially um if you when i went back and looked at a lot of the pictures and everything and so my lieutenant was was a a, a good amount of feet back and he got blasted with uh with uh pieces of concrete and brick Whereas me, like I got hit with broken up block, steel, iron. I, I got I got hit with everything that that makes up the material of a of a garage. And uh, actually, an I beam just missed a just missed my back, uh, like an actual probably a good twelve feet of of I beam just missed me. And uh, I got talking to him, and he came up with a couple things. And I said, "Well, Lieutenant," I, I said, "You know." Not for nothing, I said, but look at these pictures, and let's go back and look at this. I said, right there, there was a propane tank, and they said that there was there was a acetylene tank in there. I said, if you look at this fire, they got a ladder pipe on it, they got hand lines on it, and it's not going anywhere. It's still coming up, like it's still torching out. And uh, we came up with the synopsis of there was a, a gas line that was right there and an acetylene tank. So what, what we're coming up with, you know, departments for their own for their own reason, more than likely for everybody's own good, you know, they investigate to an, a certain extent. Excuse me, and when you have um, a line of duty and uh, death, it comes out of the department's hands. You know, anybody that's been involved in that, anybody that's seen that, anybody that's read the reports, you know, it's when NIOSH and everybody comes in, everybody does their, their investigations, ATF. When you have a near miss and everybody's okay for the most part and everybody's alive, it, it seems like, and it, it's nationwide, it seems like it's more of a, a departmental, hey, here's what happened. And it's on them if they want to make a, a, a PIA or if they just want to kind of leave it be. And a lot of departments, they leave it be because it's like, you know, this could open up something or, Hey, you know, maybe these members are going through a lot. So maybe now is not the time, you know, or just get swept under the rug, whatever the reason is, you know, every department has the reason every department operates and investigates differently, you know, and that's not a fault of anybody. That's not a bad thing. It's not a good thing. It's, it's whatever works for that department. So that's what we had come up with and everything that lines up with our synopsis appears to be the way that it happened. So it's actually pretty neat to sit back as my lieutenant and I combine our experiences and our knowledge and sit back and actually look at everything. And it's amazing of, of how much information you could get 
when you're just looking at pictures and reviewing, you know, combining stories and talking to each other about stuff. It's amazing what you come up with and how accurate and sometimes inaccurate you could actually be. So that that's what we came up with was um, a gas line coming in and then um, some kind of compressed compressed gas uh, cylinder. Yeah. All right. Well, it's good to know. And it's always something, particularly when you get into those garages, was it a, was it a mechanic shop or a body shop or do you, do you remember? Yeah. So it was closed down. Um, I, I'm, I'm not getting into details of it or do I want, do I even want to know the actual details of it? But, uh, okay. it was, uh, it, it, I think from, from report, from what people had said and how it looked, it looked like an old chop shop, you know, a mechanic shop at one point and then a chop yeah. shop took over. So yeah. especially how it was boarded up. And in the past, when I had been there, there's a couple, there was a couple uh warehouse, not warehouses, but like um, ding and dent shops back in there. So we would, you know, firehouse, you got to pay for everything yourself. So you always go in there, explore or building inspections, you explore and you see different things. And that was one thing yeah. I picked up on it. Cause I, I distinctly remember this garage from the past. I mean, I was at a truck for 12 years and uh, give or take 12 years. And, um, I remember seeing this garage all the time going, man, that's going to be a disaster. That's just going to be a crap show. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. uh, that, so I distinctly remember that garage in that area. And that's that's what I believe that it ended up being was a, was a chop, chop shop style shop. Okay. Well, good to know. You know, we always got to be cautious of those. The time we go to any of those mechanic shops or body shops, any of that sort of stuff because of what could be inside, right? And obviously you found that out the hard way. So, you know, let's let's go back to the emergency room. You're in the emergency room. You're kind of discombobulated, trying to figure out what happened and where you are, and you know what's going on. And so, just tell us a little bit about you know what your injuries ended up being, how long you were in the hospital, what your recovery looked like. I know you had some surgeries that you had to go through and all that sort of stuff. And, yeah. So um, that night was actually uh, it was weird. I, I I wasn't I wasn't there very long. I, I'm uh, Shouldn't say I wasn't there very long. I was there long enough. Um, yeah. They didn't keep me overnight. I, I think I got there about 8 o'clock, 20 hundred hours, something like that. And um, I think I got discharged about 0700 or 0630. Uh, so I wasn't there all that long. But the problem was, mm -hmm. so shock trauma is, is a treat right now to the injuries that are viewable. Or that are mm -hmm. that you could really point right then and there, you know. And I, of course, being being injured, you don't want to hear that crap. You want to be fixed. And uh, they ran me through a, a series of tests. I couldn't stand up. I could barely walk. Um, when I did stand up, my my body just wanted to give out. So they're like, I went in for all kinds of testing. Uh, took all kinds of blood work. Got some bunch of MRIs, CAT scans, things like that. Uh, and then I actually went home that morning and, uh, cane ridden in a sling, just like still trying to remember everything that happened. And, uh, I remember I had to write, you know, your PIA, even if it's in, you know, your, your most information you get with it, with it, a debriefing or anything is, is the informal process. So sitting around just talking about it and, uh, I remember I had I had to do just something informal, but formal, like in writing. Hey, what happened? And I remember just looking at my buddy, and I'm like, "Man, I I need you to fill this out. I, I don't know what the hell happened." I said, "I could tell you what happened before, but I can't tell you during or after. I, I just can't remember." And um, you know, as and that's that's the most common thing with a with a traumatic injury or a traumatic event is your mind's your mind just blocks everything out without you even realizing it. And that's its way of, of keeping you safe. I guess you could say, you know, it's probably a better way to say that is that your body, your mind's trying to keep you safe. And, uh, so I went home and, uh, I, I remember the first thing I did was I went to visit my grandma and, uh, <clears throat> The look on her face was just, it was heartbreaking. Um, she, <laughs> her, 
her old little body tried to grab a hold of me and just put it, you know, and, and was so afraid too. And I remember that was the first thing I did uh, is I wanted to go see my dog and I wanted to see my grandma. And, uh, um, so I did, you know, and I, I went home and I laid down and every time I'd close my eyes, it would just, I'd hear the explosion. Every time I went to move, my body would just scream. And, uh, finally I, I called the doctors. I said, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Like I can't use the bathroom. I can't eat. I can't do anything. I can't, I can't move. Like I'm, I'm immobile right, or I'm uh, not mobile right now at all. And uh, so they got me in for a bunch more uh, CAT scans and a bunch more MRIs and x-rays and all, all kinds of stuff. So it turned out, uh, luckily nothing was broken. I mean, I say luckily, I kind of wish things were broken because it would have been a lot easier. But uh, I ended up with a concussion, um, 100% blast injury to my right ear, and uh, ended up messing up my eardrum. So, like, when it's it's funny when you talk, or when somebody talks to you and you hear sound, you, your eardrum goes like this, and that it like kind of pulsates or beats to the sound, and it sends the waves through. Well, mine, <laughs> mine kind of does like jumping jacks. It's kind of like having a jump rope, and it just kind of does this like a like a circus wheel. So th- you know that, that's something that always makes me laugh when I look back on it. But um, yeah, I ended up with a hundred hundred percent blast injury to my right ear. Um, and a- I hate saying this word. I always screw this word up. Ingrial hernia. So it's right below, right right by your thigh, but like up just below your belly, groin area. Um. Uh, which I'm assuming is when I was trying to move or pull myself out with the impact, I'm, I'm guessing it kind of, hey, what's up, kind of deal. Um, messed up my L5S1 to where to this very day, my uh, I lose feeling in my leg. Um, some days my, my wife has to walk me up and down the steps or get me off the couch. Um, wife has to get me in bed, take me out of bed, use the bathroom. Um, it's not every day, not every day. It's uh, it's enough though to where it's it's really imposing on my life, but uh, I live in I, I do normal life. I do every, I'm in the gym every day, um, but uh, those that that's still with me until I get that fixed. Um, had really bad injuries to my shoulder and bicep. Tore my rotator cuff. Uh, tore my bicep muscle. Uh, had some screws and pins put in there. Um. A th- like I think they said it was like a two hour, three hour de- uh, debrisment, taking all the debris out of my shoulder and everything out of like all the all the inflammation or um, all the fluid, all the blood, all the tissue and everything that built up into my shoulder. Um, yeah, had uh, my back was just like completely uh, completely swollen around my L five herniated disc, protruding disc. Um, right now it's resting right on my sciatic nerve. So that's, that's never ending. Um, I think that's, I think that's it. So I, I got away pretty lucky to be honest with you. Um, it was, it was, a, I'll tell you what, it was a good wake up call to realize what you want to do with your career and your life. And that's why I feel like I got away lucky because I should be dead. Um, I'm not, I should have been paralyzed at the very least. And I wasn't and the doctors and for anybody that's in the fitness or anybody that like, I, I, I mean, we're firemen. The, the last thing we want to do is take 15 runs and then work out or, you know, get off and a long shift and then go right to the gym or, you know, and it's life, man. But let me tell you something. I, I, I'm glad I spend as much time as I did and as much time as I do in the gym because my muscle mass is what, protected my my insides what protected my bones um it overall protected the hell out of me and i'm really glad that um i'm i'm somebody that really likes to work out and i got to see the benefit of it and not many people actually get to see a positive medical influencing moment out of having a lot of muscle mass usually just show up to a show and you know, you look, you look studly for everybody or look good for somebody or put a tight t-shirt on, you know, but the, all joking aside, this was something that, that like medically proved 
muscle mass will protect you from more than what you think it could ever do. Yeah. So how long were you in, how long did you end up being off work? Um, that was in November. I came back to work June 6th. So about eight months, um, six, uh, seven, six and a half of those months were, being stuck on the couch unless uh, I took a bunch of ibuprofen and drank some whiskey, and kind of got the kind of got the blood flowing a little bit. But even that was a t- I mean, my first probably five months, I was I had a I had a cane. Four months, had a cane. Um, it was uh, yeah, it was it was lucky, but it was it wasn't all that long, but it was it was long <laughs> yeah. to say to say the least. Yeah. So during that time, I'm sure that, you know, the physical injuries are what they are and they certainly were no fun, but mentally, what was that doing to you? I mean, were you questioning, am I going to be able to make it back? Am I going to be, you know, what's my future um, hold? I'll tell you what, always- to be completely blunt, uh, to be completely blunt and honest, I didn't want to live anymore. I, I didn't want to work anymore work the fire department anymore. I didn't, I didn't want to live anymore. Um, the mental aspect of it was probably one of the hardest things I ever had to do. When you, when you come home and you have to look at the time, my kids were goodness, uh, 13, two, no three. And I think five, I'm trying to think back here. Um, and, and, you're a dad. You're their hero. You, you're unstoppable. You're Superman. You know, no matter who you are, you're, you're Superman. I mean, you could be, you could be a dad that's been a paraplegic his entire life and stuck, you know, or with a really bad disability. But in your kid's eyes, there's nothing you can't do. You know, and when you have to sit there and <clears throat> you have to look your kids in the eyes and You see the fear in their eyes. You see the the hope is gone in their eyes. You see the pain in their eyes. And they have no idea what's going on. They just know that their dad or mom or, who you know, whatever you are is hurt. And trying to deal with that on top of every time I closed my eyes and started to doze off, um, I... Your brain plays plays tricks on you sometimes. You know, you could be really tired and you start dozing off, and all of a sudden you get you get a little twitch like that, and you kind of jump, scares the shit out of you. Um, that was happening. That was happening, but it was happening with hearing, sorry, hearing um, explosions and reliving some of the some of the events that happened that night. And that's when things kind of started to come around to me. So it was a blessing that it was happening, but at the same time, it was killing me because I couldn't sleep. I couldn't, I, I couldn't eat anything. I could cause it just, it, it was taking such a toll on me. And then you add in the pain aspect of it. You know, you're, you're dealing with two of the worst things in life is your brain and pain. <laughs> you're supposed to be training your brain to disregard the pain to keep moving, but now they're working against each other. And then just the constant buzzing in my ear, and just like I I'd hear something outside and I'd, I'd like kind of jump a minute. You know, there were certain movies I couldn't watch, certain TV shows I couldn't watch for a while. Um, and I was I, I mean, I was single at the time and I, I couldn't I couldn't have my daughters overnight. They, they'd stayed with their mom because um, I couldn't I couldn't trust myself. If something happens to those kids or something happens in the house, what am I going to do? I'm stuck on the couch. I can't I can't get anywhere. Um, I remember, uh, you know, just, just trying to figure out, like, there's no way I'm ever going to make it back to work. Like, what the hell am I going to do? I'm, you know, I'm 30 some years old. Like I, I can't, I can't medically retire right now. That that's, that's suicide. You know, I can't, what kind of lifestyle am I going to, what am I going to do? Like, you know, what, what if the surgery goes bad? What if this doesn't fix it? What, and it, it those, what ifs just, just start cranking on you. And the one thing that I had by my side um, next to my daughter's was, was my dog. And that dog, 
laid by my side, that dog, you know, I, I would, I would twitch or I would tremble. Um, and my wife to this day tells me that I tremble like crazy. I'm not, if I don't take my medication, uh, my PTSD medicine. And, um, every time I would do that, my, my dog would just reach her paw over and just like kind of tap me like that. It's okay. Like that. You're all right. You know? And, um, just knowing that, like, look, man, I'm never going to ride motorcycles again. Like I'm never going to go to the gym again. I'm never going to, you know, I'll be that dad that, that like is trying to teach his kids how to ride a bike or trying to teach their kids how to, how to play softball. And I can't do anything. I'm literally just going to stand here, you know, and like, yeah, that's how you do it. Or no, that's not how you do that. You know? But all that stuff just plays over and over in your mind. And that was the hardest, one of the hardest things I ever had to deal with. I mean, I've, I've had a lot of stuff I've had, you know, a bunch of kids. I've had a bunch of babies. Um, I've seen a lot of coworkers get hurt. I've fallen through roofs. I've fallen through ceiling, um, through, through floors. Um, and it, it just goes to show that no matter how much you know your job or no matter how much you do your job, it happens. Things, things happen. Um, so you're trying to deal with all that and you, you just run it through your mind, like all these what if scenarios and, and, um, you know, what I do wrong, what I do with this. And then, you know, all that starts settling in. And then it's just, before you know it, like you, you're, you're drinking, you're drinking whiskey, you're, you know, you're popping ibuprofens and, and that, that's your life. That That's your life. I mean, what are you going to do? You know? And then, just trying to figure out, you know, you're going through counselors, you're going through this, you're going through that. You, you, and it's like, none of it's working, you know? And then next thing you know, you're, you're talking about the, the, the two-year-old body that you had to, that you had to pull out of a, a mattress that burned around them, you know? And you're like, where the hell that got you? I, I don't even remember doing that, you know, but now everything from your past that, that you've done on this job is starting to hit you hard because your mom, you allowed your mind to open that wormhole. And as soon as you open that wormhole, if you're not ready for it, it it's it's going to hit hard and it's going to hit fast. And it's going to bring up things on this job that that you know, everybody makes the joke of, uh, man, I wish I, you know, I wish I could forget what I've seen. And we all joke about it and laugh about it because that, that's what we do. We're firemen. But in reality, you do forget about it. And then when you let your mind go down that wormhole, that's it. It. it Everything that you've been through, everything that you've done, some of your near misses, some of your like, oh, how the hell did we get out of that? That all starts coming back. And it that's when the effects of PTSD, um, severe depression, um, functional anxiety really starts to come in and everything hits all at the same time. There's no, well, I think today, today's Monday, so we'll do this today and We'll do this one Saturday, and then we'll hit them with this on Tuesday. No, it's midnight on Monday, and you're waking up, bawling your eyes out, going, what the hell was that? And it just yeah. it pushes you even further down, you know? Mm -hmm. So what ultimately made the difference for you to get back to work? With everything you had going on mentally, physically, I know you said your kids, your dog, you know, you, talk, you mentioned counseling, but what ultimately got, you know, you said you're off eight months. Where was it? Month six, month seven, where you decided I can't go on this way. I got to get back to the job. I got to do what I need to do to, to get better. Um, hit and miss throughout the month of December, you know, oh, I'm, I'm getting back to work. Nothing's going to stop me. I'm, I'm Chris, I, I'm Chris short. I'm shorty. I got this. Nothing's going to stop me. And then the following week is I'm never going to do this. And on January, yeah. I, that's it, man. I'm, th I'm almost three months in. There ain't no way. So then after all that happened, my grandma died in February. And the week before she died, we were just having a conversation. She goes, you know, I think, I, I think it's time you, you get another, get another Harley and we go ride. It's my, my 82 year old grandmother. Right. I'm like, hell yeah, absolutely. As soon as I get back to work, that's the first thing I'll do is I'll buy another because I rode my whole life. But with a family, I said, you know what, I'm going to give it up and just kind of, you know, be a family man. 
and yeah. uh, spend more time with my family than I do ride. So I got out of it for a little while. And uh, the week before she died, I was uh, sitting there. We're, we're watching um, a repeat of, Gar- of the Garth Brooks concert in real life of, of his background, his life story, and da 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 And she loves Garth Brooks, so we're sitting there watching that. And we got talking, and I said, you know what, Nani? I said, you're right. I said, you got to get back to riding. I miss it. She mm-hmm. goes, yeah, and I want to go riding. I want, I want, I want you to take me on a nice long ride. I said, okay, Nani, you got it. Knowing damn well inside my head, 82 years old, she ain't going to ride that long, but we'll take some breaks. Yeah. I'll make her dreams come true. And I knew what it meant for her, for me to get back to work. So uh, she had died towards the end of February and losing my grandmother was, was dev- like that. That was devastating. She was more of my mom. She was my best friend. I talked to her every day two or three times a day. Um, we went on hundred dates together. We, we would go, you know, movie dates. We would do dinner dates. We would, you know, just be pigs and sit at the house and eat everything in sight and watch whatever we wanted to put on TV and Christmas movie. You know, she was my everything. And um, yeah. losing her and then seeing the pain in my kid's eyes and then going down – so I actually took my grandma down for uh, a visit. I had to go to the one doctor. So we went to Baltimore and uh, she went with me. And when we got there, we're hanging out at the firehouse and she's laughing. She's having a good time with the guys and they're picking on her, you know, firehouse, kitchen table stuff. And I just, I, I remember looking over at her and just seeing this, this little twinkle in her eye every time she looked at me or every time she would look at my, my crew. And then I'm seeing the, the pain in my crew's eyes. Like, I can't believe this happened to Shorty. Like, there's no way. You're Chris Short, man. There's no way this happened to you, you know. And then mm-hmm. we ended up, they ended up in the fire as we were getting ready to leave. And I said, you know what, Nani? Let's go, let's, let's go buff a fire. Let's go check a fire out. We <laughs> drove down and we're, we're standing there. And she's like, this is awesome. You know, fire charge, breaking windows, cutting roofs, you know, whole, whole nine yards. And uh, I just remember after after she had died, you know, I, I went further into depression and further into everything and um, <laughs> was holding on by a thread, to be honest with you. And uh, I just remember turning to my dog and literally like, Sadie, we we got to do this. Like, Taters, your, your daddy can't be down like this. You know, I, I got to come back. I'm, I'm, I'm Chris Short. I'm Shorty. You don't keep me down, man. We, we push. And um, I just started pushing really hard and like, you know, calling my crew, like, look, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I, I will be back. You mark my words. Um, so I had had one of my surgeries and uh, the doctor, it was probably, so I had, I had my surgery on President's Day. Uh, that following week, my grandma died by second week of March, third week of March, um, I said, all right, doc, what do I got to do for my shoulder? What do I got to do for my, my bicep? He's like, well, you're going to do these exercises for a couple of weeks. Then you're going to kind of start getting into like a five pound weight. Da, 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 da. He's like, and uh, eventually I want you to do at least five pushups. I said, all right, cool. So I told him I got the timeline wrong. I said, oh, I couldn't remember what you said, doc. So that first two weeks, I just started picking up a five, five pound weight. You know, a couple of days later, I picked up a 10 pound weight. A couple of days later, I picked up a 20 pound weight. And then I was like, you know what? I'm not done yet. I, I'm going to push this. It was probably like three weeks later. So I'm going to push this. And I got down. I busted out 50 push ups. And uh, I remember a couple of days later, I, I told myself that night, I was like, all right, let, let's chill out with this for a little while because it's, it's starting to hurt a little bit. So I remember about, th- about yeah, a couple of weeks later, it wasn't too long. I called the doctor. I said, hey, man, my shoulder's killing me. I said, my bicep just does not look right. I said, don't it feel right? He goes, well, what have you been doing? So I ran him through everything. He goes, are you kidding me? You're not supposed to do that yet. Like, that's you're nowhere near that yet. I said, well, I did it. You know, and right then and there, it kind of clicked like, all right, you had your time. You had your poor me bull crap. You had your, oh, I can't believe this happened. Oh, my God, depression crap. It's time to get back. It's time to be a man. It's time to be that that part of me, that badass West Side Baltimore City fireman. So uh, I did. 
And next thing I knew, I was I was jogging. I was taking the girls for hikes. My you know my daughters for hikes. Um, I had a mile long hill in my hometown. I would throw all my gear on, and I'd run up as fast as I could up to the to a block, and then I would stop, do eight count body, do um, ten eight count bodybuilders, jump back up. I'd run to the net, and I would do that as much as I could, even if it was alternate push ups, even if it was I slow my pace down. I was still pushing myself to the point where by the time I got to the top of that mile long hill, I was throwing up and I'd come back down and I would do it again. And then the other side of town, we had um, a set of set of black steps that go up a hill and it was two sets of steps. And I remember just as soon as I did that, I would walk over there and I would start running those. I would do five, six, seven, eight laps on those to the point where I just I wanted to just either sleep or pass out. Um, from exhaustion, you know, from just body being exhausted. And, um, then I remember like it hit about May and I'm getting ready for my work hardening. And, uh, I just started, I, I got back up to a, to, um, a 12 minute for two miles run. I got back up to, um, I think it was, I think I was pushing 110, 120 push ups. Um, then I started doing some more calisthenics. I started doing some more aerobic exercises i started you know doing a lot more core and i just remember like my couple friends calling me like hey man you're missing this fire you're missing i said don't you worry i said sure to be back by summer i'll be there so you mark my words i'll be back by june and uh i just i pushed and pushed and pushed until i literally just couldn't push my body anymore and uh so i have to go for a functional capacity exam to make sure I can still operate on the fire ground. It's a little test. This my, my jurisdiction does. So, um, I go in, I do that. I show up to the infirmary and I hand I hand the, the, the letter over to the infirmary. I said, I didn't get to see this yet. Cause it came to me in a sealed envelope. I said, but here, you know, here's my FCE stuff. And she's sitting there looking at it. And she's looking at me and she's looking at it. She's looking at me. I said, sweetheart, is everything all right? You, you good? Did I fail? Like, no, you literally surpassed everything by like pounds of weight, not even like five, 10, like 25, 30, 40 pounds of weight. You, you, you know, you surpassed all the, the, um, um, anaerobic stuff. You, you passed like all this stuff. She goes, so you're, you're back on. Hold on. And, um, sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> I live on a busy show. and, um, I remember just, I got out to my car and I just literally started crying and I'm talking to, you know, I'm talking to Nani up in heaven, you know, in heaven or wherever she's at. And I just started talking to her and I'm like, God, we did it. We did it. They're like, we did it, you know? And, um, yeah, that was nutshell my journey. <laughs> uh, it was not easy, but I'm happy that, uh, no. I'm happy that you made it and you're able to share it with us. Cause, uh, I know telling those stories isn't always easy. So it definitely uh, not. <laughs> yeah. To me, it's, uh, they're not easy to share, but at the same time, sharing them, it's kind of therapy, you know, and the more you tell them, at least for me, the more I, I tell stories about issues I've had, the, the better I feel about that issue, even though I you know, wouldn't necessarily wish it on somebody else, but it just helps to take away some of that pain or, mental anxiety that associated with it. So appreciate you doing that. So you make it back to truck A. What was it like? I'm sure obviously you were excited. Um, but you know, do you have any trepidation? Did you have any, were you second guessing yourself? Were you concerned about anything when you got back? That was a nightmare. My first shift driving was a nightmare. Um, I didn't sleep at all the night before, literally not at all. Um, it was a mix of being excited, a mix of being scared, a mix of ner just nerves. It was just all nerves. Um, and I remember getting, I remember walking in and I actually relieved really early that morning. I think it was probably quarter to five, five o'clock in the morning. And I'm usually there five 30. So I, I just got there. I was like, I just want to get the initial over with. So I did. And, um, Obviously, my crew and everybody is, is worried about me. And hey, man, you know, you're gonna be all right. Like, we're gonna have a good day. Da, da da da. 
So we go out, we didn't even get a run yet. We actually go out to do uh, some building inspections. And um, what I liked about, and I, I try to do this now as a lieutenant, um, what my lieutenant did was uh, he'd always turn a, like a building inspection or something into training as well, pointing things out, going over things, how are we going to do this, how are we going to do that. And I remember driving there to, to the building and uh, he just looked over at me and he kept looking at me and kept looking at me. And neither one of us said anything. And I'm just putting along. You know, I thought I was driving fine. And um, we pull up to, to the building we're doing and, and he's talking about you know, what we're going to do. And it's that. And I remember just being so spaced out. I'm like, I don't belong here. I got to go home. Like, I can't. I can't be here. I'm not ready for this. I thought I was I pushed myself. I, sh I shouldn't be here right now. So we're driving back and I didn't say, you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer. in if there's issues or there's something going on, you, you know, you, you do that stuff in private, you pull the officer or you as the officer, pull the, pull your, your crew, the member of your crew that's struggling aside and you talk to them privately. So we're out, we're out in public. I'm not saying anything. Yeah. So uh, we get in the truck, I turn around to go back and, and I'm, I'm just putting along. I'm thinking I'm doing great, man. And finally we get to a stoplight and he just looks over at me and goes, you all right? I'm like, I don't know. Not really. I said, I, don't, I think I should go home. He's like, well, you're, you realize you're only doing like 10 miles an hour, right? I was like, no. <laughs> I thought I was cruising along. Yeah, I was only doing about 10 miles an hour. I was just, it, it was, I was so out of it and so afraid. And I uh, backed the truck in. We, uh, he pulls me up. He goes, let's, let's, go, let's go talk. I said, all right, Lou. So we talk and I, I broke down to him and he goes, listen, he's like, you know, as well as I do, there's people that, that shouldn't push past stuff and should give it time. And then there's people that can push past it and get past it. He's like, and that's you and I, he's like, so why don't you just chill, hang out. I, I'll have somebody else drive. I said, you know what, Lou? I said, I haven't slept. It's my first shift back. I said, I'm gonna go upstairs and lay down. Just give me, give me 20 minutes, you know? And he did. And uh, he's like, look, listen, if you don't feel any better within the next hour, he said, you're going home. I said, right, well, I assure you, Lieutenant, I'm taking back what I said. I'll be fine. And uh, I went upstairs, man. I passed out. It must have been fun. It was a really, it was a perfect first day back. We, we barely took any runs during the day. They all came at night. And I must have, I must have woke up about three hours later and I was ready to go. I was, you know, then we finally took a run. I actually think we took a box to report of a fire. And it was like, I never left. Everything was good. I was golden, you know, and then the day came where I had to drive by the incident. And I took the longest way possible to get to the, it was a non-emergency run, thank God. But I took the longest way to get there. Um, and then of course, over as time progressed, I could just drive by it now and just throw up the middle finger and just kind of laugh about it. You know, it's kind of how I deal with it. But um, it, that, that first initial back was a nightmare. It was very difficult. It was very gut wrenching. It was, it was just, it was bad. And it was one of those, like, I'm second guessing every single thing about my life right now, <laughs> but I'm glad at the end of the day, I'm really glad I stayed on and didn't go off or anything because honestly, by the time I had woken up from a nap, it was like nothing ever happened. Like we were, I was joking again. I was, you know, come on, get on the truck. We got to go, you know, like just busting balls, just everything. And it was like nothing ever happened. And it staying on that day, although, and I know a lot of brass and I know a lot of medical people and I know a lot of, um, not so on the edge line officers will sit there and say, that's wrong. You should have went off. You should have done this, but they're not wrong, but they're not right. It's, um, it's in my eyes that that's a, that's a judgment call that has to be made for the right reason. And sometimes, you know, your kid gets hit with a softball at their first softball game, or your, your son gets hit by a baseball at the first baseball game. That next time he goes up there, he's going to, or she goes up there, they're going to be shaky. They're going to be nervous. They're going to be, oh, I can't do this, dad. I can't do this, mom. I don't want to do that. I don't want to get hit. I don't want to get hit. And then all of a sudden, the first ball comes in and it misses him. Another ball comes in and misses him. 
Then all of a sudden the ball comes in, they hit that ball for the first time after being hit by the ball. And the enjoyment that they get and the outlook they get on that now and the way it just turns everything around like they were never struck by a, a bad pitch before. You know, it, it's it's exhilarating for you as a parent. It's exhilarating for that person. And when I got to be myself again later in that day, I, I saw it in my crew's face. I saw it on my lieutenant's face. They were relieved. They were, oh, yeah, we got Shorty back. All right, yeah, we might have to work on things a little bit, but he's back. He, he's doing his job. It's not, it's not that he can't do his job. You know, let, let's joke around. Let's have fun. And that's what we did. We, we partied in the firehouse like it was our last shift together. And it just, I came back two days later and was like, all right, let's roll. Let's do it, you know? And it, it, I'm so happy. I don't know. I think if I went off that day, that would have been temperamental to my mental health and it would have been temperamental in my career yeah. if I had went off. And I'm really, really glad that I'm a, I'm a rule bender. And I'm an opposite person of what most people are and just refuse to do it and just hung in there because I don't think I'd be where I am right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. I'm, I'm glad you stayed too. <laughs> so let's, uh, obviously there's a, there's a lot of positives in your story, but, uh, at the same time, there's a lot of darkness and negativity. So let's, let's, uh, let's try and move on to some happier times. You leave truck eight. You go to yeah. truck five, one of the busiest trucks in the city, or the busiest truck in the city, from what I understand. Um, what was that like? What was it like switching crews and, you know, that sort of stuff? I'll tell you, man, it was uh, – switching crews would have been one thing. I mean, I went from B shift to, to A shift when I got – or B shift to a whole other uh, side of the city, to a whole other house when I originally got promoted to EVD. Um, came back to a truck uh, about six, seven months, eight months later, something, I don't know, some, it wasn't very long. I was gone. I can't remember the actual timeline. Um, just throwing numbers out there, but it wasn't very long. And I came back, switched shifts, uh, went to this shift. And then, you know, my, uh, my Lieutenant that was on that accident with me, who's now a captain, he pulled me over to his shift. So ch switching, switching, um, shifts and crews would have been easy. I spent, uh, I spent 12, 11 and a half, 12 years at eight trucking. So that's in Southwest Baltimore, which is in the third battalion. Um, we run with a lot of you guys have heard of eight, eight engine, 10 truck. Um, a lot of you guys have heard of engine 14, Fort Hollins and 14 and us were like really tight. And to this day, a lot of us are still very, very tight to each other. And I went from, Southwest Baltimore and the third battalion doing about 25 to 2,800 runs a year. And I said, you know what? It's time for a change. Went all the way over to East Baltimore, the truck company five that has no engine station with it. And just some, just some support units and medic units. And to about almost 5,000 runs a year in a whole different section of the city, a whole new district. In the second battalion, I had been detailed there. I know the guys there, like it, I know what I was getting into. But to go from knowing almost everything about your area and your surrounding area and being somewhere for so long and having that comfort of like, eh, we might actually sleep tonight, or you know, we're probably gonna go to a fire tonight, but we're gonna sleep, or you know, hey, it's gonna be a busy night, but at least we can get some stuff done during, done during the day. You know, 2,500 runs a year, 2,800 runs a year. Divided across four shifts, it's not that bad. Well, now I'm over here doing almost 5,000 runs a year. And uh, the most, I, I think we ended up being, I think we ended up being, if my memory serves me right, the um, the busiest truck company as far as first in boxes, I, I believe. Not fires, but actual like box alarms and then um, second or third for like working fires and stuff. So it was a whole nother, like, holy crap, what did I get into? So I had to learn a whole new area. I had to learn a whole new truck. I had to learn different personalities. I had to, oh, my God. So the, the list goes on. And I needed I needed a change. Um, while I was at a truck, like, I've lost a lot of friends. I lost a lot of stuff. Uh, I ended up getting hurt. My grandma died. <laughs> I feel like a country song. Um, <laughs> so I needed that change. 
you know, uh, yeah. I needed something to just kind of bring me back to reality here and bring me back to, to me and try to get me back into the job the way I used to be. So I did that change and it was like, it was a great experience. I loved it. I was there um, probably about a year and a half and it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, everybody was on the same page cause you're busy. Everybody, you know, everybody just wanted to work. Everybody, that want, everybody that was there wanted to go to work, wanted to go to a fire, wanted to take a run, wanted to do that, you know? So it was nice. It was a good environment and it was a very good learning experience. It was a good learning curve. Um, I made the best of it, I think. So it was, it was, it was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like it. And then you get promoted. So you go from driving to the right front seat. So what's that been like? Talk to the audience a little bit about that. You know, we, we hear about buddy to boss and going from the back step to the front seat and all that sort of stuff. But not only did you do that, but you also flipped from a truck company mentality to now you're, you have to have that engine company mindset. So, you know, what, what, what's that been like for you? Not only being a first line supervisor, but now you're thinking like an engine guy instead of a truck guy. So. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I've been, I, I've been in many roles throughout my life. Uh, I, I've held assistant chief spots. I've held captain spots, you know, all in volunteer world, stuff like that. Um, and then I had been on a truck for so long, uh, pretty much half my career. Well, at this point, my whole career. Um, and I got rumors that I was getting promoted. I got, you know, we had a big, we had a big, big promotional list that, that that's out, um, you know, 70, 80, 100 people on it. And I'm sitting like, I think I was sitting 52 I think 51 or 52. And I'm like, there ain't no way I'm getting promoted, dude. Like I didn't study. I didn't do, you know, I just, i read a little bit like a couple of weeks before and just from, I'm the type of guy that uh, I practice what I preach. So when I go and I teach people, I do the same thing. When I tell people, Hey, you should probably do this or read this or do this. That's what I do. So I had kept up on everything. So it really wasn't that bad to just kind of review. Um, so I came out terrible on the list. Like in my eyes, it was terrible. You know, in your own eyes, you're, you're never what you should be or what you think you should be or where you should be at. You know, it's always one of our life hurdles that we have that we battle ourselves on. And uh, <laughs> I remember everybody, man, I'm like, there ain't no way I'm getting promoted. There's no way. You're going to make me a lieutenant, really? And uh, all of a sudden I get a phone call and they're like, yeah, man, you know, you're getting promoted. Da, da, da. So-and-so is leaving. Who's going to promote this guy? Who's going to promote you? I'm like, huh, no kidding. I guess I am getting promoted. All right, cool. So, um, immediately, man, I, I called up my, my captain cause I was on the captain shift and, uh, I said, Hey cat. So rumor has it. He goes, yeah, you're getting promoted. I already know. I'm like, all right. I said, from now on, can I start riding the seat? Can I start being in charge? Can I start doing the paperwork? Can I start doing payroll? And everybody I worked with on, because I work a lot of overtime, I work a lot of sw uh, mutual swaps for people because I always need days off, of course. So, you know, I end, I end up working a lot. And everywhere I'd go, I'd be like, hey, man, so I know I'm supposed to drive, but I'm also making lieutenant. Do you mind if we switch? You know, so that, that was cool. So I got to experience it before I actually made it. And that made for a very tolerable transition. Um, the biggest hurdle I had was I had never been to this company except once. And I was riding fifth man to, we, we run four guys on a truck, four guys on an engine, four guys on a rescue and four guys on a squad. Um, fireman, sorry, fireman. And, um, <laughs> I, I had only been there once to go to EMT training and that was, I've never stepped foot in that firehouse. I've never, I've met people there maybe a couple times, like one, one or two people I might've known for a while, but that's it. So I had that hurdle. I had 12 years on a truck company, transitioning to an engine company. I had to look for hydrants. Like I, what the hell are they? You know, <laughs> what are we doing? Uh, yeah. I remember being so excited and so stoked. Uh, I'm at work and the captain, I think it was that day with the captain, or might have been, I might have been on another shift with a lieutenant. And I said, "Hey, man, um, 
Lou, you mind if I if I do all the office stuff today? He's like, no, 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 go ahead, man. So I'm in there and I'm like printing off um, the, the the XD the uh, XD nozzles we got. I'm, I'm printing off the hose loads. I'm printing off uh, high rise for engine companies, I, like all this engine stuff. And I'm like sitting in there, like getting lost in all these all these procedures and everything. And I'm like, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, I end up showing up for my first shift, and I couldn't I I couldn't have got any luckier. Um, the my my first acting man, which is my senior man, he's been a godsend. He uh, he's been there for tw- nineteen years, twenty years. His whole career has been at Thirty One Engine, which is in the Second Battalion, which is East Baltimore, right? Literally a mile from Truck Five, where I was. So it really wasn't that big of a tra- like area transition. So it actually was pretty cool. Um, and. Uh, I pulled him up the first day and I'm like, all right, man, what do I got to do? What, what, you know, um, you and I are just talking, what, what do you want? What, what are we going to do? You know? So he ran me through some things and um, finally I sat everybody down. I said, look, man, and, and if I can give any advice to anybody, your first month, your first two months, stop worrying about trying to be a Lieutenant, you know, worry about your job at hand, worry about the three other guys lives that are in your hand. Um, you know, don't sit there and, and be a stickler for everything under the sun, because at the same time, you're going into a place in a new spot in a new company in a new part of the city or a new crew or whatever it is, it's new to you. Worry about working together. Worry about that cohesiveness. Worry about, you know, where do these guys stand? What are, what are their expectations of me? Because here's my expectations from them. And that's something that I did was I got there and I said, look, guys, I said, all I'm going to tell you is I'm learning. I want to know from you guys. I want I want to learn from you guys. And at the same time, I want you guys to learn from me. And, you know, here's my idea. What do you guys think about this? You know, for the first couple couple uh, tours of training. And uh, they were more than willing to be on board. I mean, they're, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's go do this. We'll go. I'm like, all right, cool. So we're actually capitalizing off each other. So I'm here a day and we're already like climbing that ladder. Like we're rolling. And um, it's been like that ever since. I mean, that was July 5th. Well, July 7th, I think was my first shift. Um, here we are. It's, it's December essentially. And nothing has changed. Like for the bad, it's all been progressive. It's all been, going great. Well, then all of a sudden the Baltimore city fire department says, Hey, we're going to give you a rookie straight out of rookie school. I said, what? (laughs) All right, cool. Great. But it ended up being a really great endeavor because I'm teaching him what I learned and some of the stuff that I've learned over the years. And he's teaching me, how to how to deal with the situation that I'm in. I'm a new lieutenant getting a brand new guy out of the, out of rookie school. So we're like kind of working off each other. And the best part of it is I got, I'm going to toot my own horn here a little bit. I got so good with it that he didn't realize what was actually transpiring between us. So it actually ended up, everything turned out to be picture perfect and just all around awesome. Uh, now I'm having the time of my life. I've, we've had some first and fires. We've had some fires where, you know, we're not going in. So we got to alternate our, our, our uh, attack. And it, it's been probably one of the greatest learning experiences I've ever got to have. And now, uh, like I got, I got pulled up today. I was out at incident safety officer class out the Academy. And uh, one of the guys came up to me. He's like, dude, I haven't seen, I've never seen you smile this much. I said, what's not to smile about? I'm a lieutenant in the Baltimore City Fire Department. Like, this is great. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, four years ago, I thought I was going to die. Now I'm like, oh, I'm a lieutenant. Like, let's do this. You know, so it's been it's been the greatest experience career-wise that I've ever got to have. It was definitely a good move. Good. Good deal. What are some uh, – I know you, you, uh, you already talked about coming into a new spot and admitting – you know, that you're learning and 
and that you've got a lot to learn as a new lieutenant. Um, and I appreciate that because I, I see a lot of people who think that, you know, they, they have to act the part, you know, they can't be um, vulnerable. They can't show their weak side. They can't admit that they have shortcomings because suddenly they got a bugle or a couple of bugles on their chest. Um, and I think that's one of the things that probably derails or um, causes officers more issues than otherwise they would if they just come in and say, look, let's just, let's just get down to brass tacks. I'm new at this or, you know, they may have been an officer, but they're new to a, to a company or they're switching from a truck to an engine or the other way around. That, that goes so far with the guys. I mean, you don't want to come in and have the guys question uh, your capabilities. Obviously you don't want to come in there and look like you really don't know at all what you're doing. But at the same time, I think a little humility goes a long way. And uh, you just kind of reinforced that point. So I appreciate it. So um, what else would you say, uh, you know, what, what are some other takeaways, whether it's from your injuries, whether it's from going from an engine to a truck getting promoted to lieutenant, what are some other uh, tips or tricks or takeaways that you think uh, you'd like to share? Um, let's allow things to make you humble and remember at the end of the day, and I know that this is very cliche, um, but this is, you know, speaking straight from the heart and from experiences. Um, you're a lot, you're a lot stronger and you could do a lot more and you could be a lot more than you would ever think. Um, I know there's a lot of, conceited people in the world that I deserve this. I could do this. I'm going to do this. And unfortunately, sometimes they get humbled and they don't know what to do with themselves when that happens. And that's a very common thing, especially amongst men, you know, type A personalities. That's a very big thing. And there's nothing wrong with that, but use everything that you do, use everything that you go through, use everything that you see as a learning stone, take it to heart. Don't take it with your feelings, but take it to heart and lock it in there and use that to make yourself better tomorrow. And then the hell with tomorrow, make yourself better a year from now. Everything that you go through and everything that you experience, nobody's ever going to do because that's your own personal experience. Um, I, I'm at the point in my life and my career where I could look at certain things that most people couldn't, you know, a, a child or, you know, um, really bad accidents or whatever. And just, yeah, whatever, you know, but that's because I've learned over the years how, how to get myself in a position of where I can do something about it with my own mind and my own body. But that wouldn't have happened if I, if I didn't learn how to, to be humble, if I didn't learn how to, take things that I've been through and use them to my advantage. And I think that's one thing that I could say to everybody out there is, so what if you dropped the ball? So what if you forgot something? So what if, if you have to start over and you have to sit down and say, teach me, teach me. So what? Allow it to happen because you're going to turn around and you're going to end up looking back on it going, that was probably one of the best things I ever did. You know, that was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me in the worst way, <laughs> you know, and it, just, it gives you a whole different outlook on life when you start allowing things to not go as planned. Not everything has to be a plan. Not everything is a Hallmark Christmas movie. You know, things are going to happen. Things are going to pop up, deal with it, but do it the right way. And use it as an experience, use it as knowledge, use it as an education and dust yourself off. So when I go to the gym, guys will go there, women will go there and y'all, y'all look in the mirror and you're looking at your figure and you look, Oh, I look great. I do that. You know, I go there and in my hand to my wife, to my family, I go there and I look in that mirror and I make myself get upset with what I, what I see. I make myself think about some of the things that I've been through 
And I use my face as the devil that I'm fighting. Because your mind, if you allow it to, it's going to push you to a point where you're constantly going to battle yourself. So I use that as my motivation when I'm in the gym. And I'll look in the mirror and I'll think back on all the things that should have brought me down, all the things on the job that, that I felt like took over my life and controlled me for so long because I couldn't allow myself to be humble. I couldn't allow myself to break and just cry once in a while or just talk to a buddy about it. So now I use that in the gym and I leave the gym feeling great. I, I leave, you know, with so much off my mind and so much off my back. It's incredible. So you learn, learn how to take everything and build yourself. And that that's all I can say about all of that. It's just, let it happen, but do something about it and do it in the right way. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. It uh, takes a lot to, to open up like that. So uh, I want to thank you for uh, spending a little over an hour with us uh, this evening on the, on the podcast. Um, I see you got your Christmas tree up there in the background. So yeah, I hope you have a good, yeah. uh, good Christmas and uh, you working Christmas this year. Or are you off? I I am actually off this year, surprisingly. The wife and I are both off. Yeah, good for you. Yeah. Yeah. I work Christmas Eve, but that's it. So I'm off Christmas Day as well. So um at least you're so off the day. What's that? I said at least you're off yeah. the day the day side of Christmas break. <laughs> right, absolutely. Yep. So um Chris, I want to thank you uh on behalf of the audience and uh Myself and Fire Engineering and Hooks and Hoses podcast. Thanks for being part of part of the show um, this time around, and uh, appreciated everything you had to say. Um, learned a lot. You know, obviously, I learned a lot about you that I didn't know, but also um, uh, learned a lot about you know the job, and you know, you gave me some things to think about. So I appreciate that, and I'm sure that the uh, audience will, will have the same same opinion. So. Um, just in closing for this month's episode, I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas um, and hope you know, hope you have a good Happy New Year. If you haven't signed up for the hands-on classes at FDIC in 2024, they are selling out. It will fill up. Uh, it probably will be a sold-out show probably early in 2024. So if you haven't signed up, I recommend that you do that soon. Um, Otherwise, you may miss out on an opportunity to come and uh, attend some of those classes. Um, as always, um, you know, if you're listening to this on one of the audio platforms or you're watching it on YouTube, I ask that you uh, like, give me a thumbs up or a four or five star review. Um, helps promote the podcast and, and uh, get it out to more people. And uh, lastly, if you uh, if you have anything you want to, any guests you want to suggest to me or anything you want to reach out and talk about, uh, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, and if you do a search for my name on the internet, um, you'll come across me and uh, you'll be able to find my email as well. So um, that being said, I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight and uh, see you in January. Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip, the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit MagnaGrip.com. The Fire Store, equipping protectors with passion. Every decision the Fire Store makes as a company is about its customers. As the holiday season has quickly approached, explore a wide selection of unique and practical gifts at the Fire Store's Gift Center. Find the perfect presence for firefighters, EMTs, and first responders today. The Fire Store's goal is to get you the gear you need when you need it at prices you can afford. Visit thefirestore.com for everything but the truck and shop its family of brands including Streamlight, MSA, Lion, Fleer, and more.